Hello, as you can see today I'm going to be doing a how to set up and play of the board game Conan. This came out uh, in 2016 I believe it was a Kickstarter. I think there were different pledge levels. Um, anyway I got it I guess that's when I got it I don't remember exactly I show that I played it a couple of times in 2017 and then I'd put it away and uh, I guess for some reason hadn't pulled it out again till this week when I pulled it out, played a scenario and thought I should go ahead and do a how to set up and play on this. So let's get started with how to set up Conan. First thing the players will do is choose one of the scenarios. Uh, there's quite a few in the Overlord uh, book that comes in the game. So this is a kind of one versus many. Um, so one player will play the overlord and get uh, you know a number of minions and characters that he will control and then the other players will control the heroes and they'll each control one hero so anyway the first thing you'll do is pick a scenario and that will tell you which of the boards uh, the game that I got uh, came with two boards it double-sided so four different maps we'll go ahead and do set up for scenario one so the first thing you do is choose a scenario and then find the map that goes along with that scenario. You then place that board in the center of the play area. We're doing the scenario in the clutches of the Picts. So we're using the Picked Village map board. So we place that in the center of the table. You then just place all your dice somewhere nearby. This scenario would give will give suggested heroes for uh, the chosen scenario so the players that are going to play heroes will choose which of the uh, heroes they want to play and they'll take the corresponding figure and equipment shown and put that in their play area along with that hero's uh, player sheet so for instance this character say said we needed Conan so we take the Conan character sheet the Conan figure now these figures uh, models don't become don't come painted. I did my <laughs> normal mediocre paint job on uh, on these figures you'll see during this playthrough. But they, the ones that come with the game unpainted, they're kind of a light gray for the hero figures and a dark gray for the enemy figures. It also said in the suggested characters that Conan should start with the battle axe, shield, and leather armor which you'll find in this asset deck. So you just go through there and find the starting equipment that it said your character should have. So those go ahead and you just place those near your character sheet. Again, that's shown here. Um, this is for three heroes, which is what we're going to be playing with. If you were going to play with four heroes, it gives you uh, an additional suggested one here. But we're just going to play with these three. So we need Shavatas with Chris and throwing knives and Hadrathus with Dagger, and then these are spells, Teleportation, Mitra's Hilo, Halo, and Lightning Storm. And it says that Hadrathus Hadr Hadr starts with Mitra's Halo cast. So I'll show you what all that means. Let me get that set up. For Hadrathus, you find the spell deck. This is what the back of those cards look like. And it said he should start with Teleportation, Lightning Storm, and Mitra's Halo, Halo, Mitra's Halo, and from the asset deck it said he should start with the dagger. Here's his miniature and his character sheet. So we just put those, and it also said in those instructions that he starts with Mitra's Halo cast. So that comes with this uh, little token, and if that's cast, his it goes. Um, his miniature goes inside of it and that lets you know that that spell is active and we'll talk more about what those spells are and all that later when we get into how to play and finally we have Shavatas um, this is his miniature and it said he starts with the throwing knives and the Chris so again those are out of the asset deck so you just find those put those near the character sheet and uh, your miniature nearby. 
on each player's character sheet you'll see this green area that's your reserve zone and it has a number there you'll put a number of blue gems in that space equal to that number so for Conan we'll put 11 blue gems there in his reserve area for Hadrathus we'll put 10 and for uh, Shavatas we will put 10 all right so I have these gems uh, placed on their character sheet these uh, indicate or are their energy that they can use to take actions and we'll talk more about that as we get into the how to play and again looking at your scenario that you're going to play each character uh, or each player will place their hero character on in the location on the map uh, indicated so Conan will go up here in this area, Hadrathus will go here, and Shavata starts over here. And so looking back at our game board, you'll see the Conan miniature I've placed here, where he's indicated for this scenario. Hadrathus here in this area, where he's indicated. And uh, finally Shavata over here, where his image was indicated. Alright, so we've got the heroes on the board. All right, then you'll also look here where it tells about your heroes and it gives some instructions that after setup, each hero moves five gems from their reserve zone to their fatigue zone. So on a player's character sheet, you have the green, which is the reserve zone, this kind of lighter red, which is the fatigue zone, and this dark area, which is the wound zone. So it said to move five, so each character, each of the heroes moves five of their uh, gems over to their fatigue zone, according to the scenario instructions, so that will be different per scenario. Alright, so I've got that done for Conan, uh, Hadrathus, and Shavatus. Then each hero will take a a red gem and place it on this is called the recovery chart and you'll place it on the sun or the aggressive that's for aggressive stance they'll each place a red gem on the sun which is the aggressive stance on their recovery chart the overlord player will then take this dashboard which is called the book of skelos they'll place that in their area then they'll look at the scenario to see how many gems they start with. So in our scenario, in the clutches of the picks, it says if we're playing with three heroes, which we are, the Overlord starts with ten gems in their reserve zone and three gems in their fatigue zone and places the recovery token showing, the, showing a recovery value of five in the Book of Skelos. So this is the recovery token. Um, there's, a, there's another ones, but this is the one with the value of five that they were mentioning. So that goes here in the Book of Skelos. Then it said they start with ten gems in their reserve zone, which is the green. All right, and the Overlord uses the red gem, so I've got ten gems in their reserve zone. And then it said they start with three in their fatigue zone. So we'll place three additional gems in the Overlord's fatigue zone. This portion of the Book of Skelos down here is called the River. You'll look in the scenario. Again, we're doing in clutches of the peaks. And it will tell you which unit tiles um, you're going to place in your river and the order they'll start. So, for instance, here we have the picked hunters with the blue border. You have uh, Zogar Zat. <laughs> Zogar Sag, or whatever his name is right here. Anyway, you find all of these uh, different tiles and place them in the river in this order. So let me do that. All right, so I've got those tiles set up in the river. we got the blue picked hunters. Zogar Sag, he's an individual. This will represent a group of picked hunters. This is just going to be one individual. Uh, this in uh, it represents a group of picked warriors. This will represent a group of hyenas. This will represent a group of picked hunters. This will uh, represent an individual giant snake. A group of picked hunters, and this is an event tile. And the effects of the event are shown uh, 
in the scenario. So again, looking back at the scenario, you can see the event tile is used to bring in reinforcements, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we get into how to the pl how to play. Um, in this scenario, uh, Zogar Sag has no uh, spells. Down here, it shows for Zogar Sag and uh, the giant snake. That's their life points, so they'll have that many life points. Every other figure will just have one life point. Then you'll place the models um, or the miniatures um, for each of these um, units in the ri um, that are shown in the river, as depicted here on the the uh, scenario image so you'll see like for here for the blue picked hunters we have three here in this hut and one over here in this hut so we'll need four uh, blue picked hunters so you'll take the picked hunter miniatures and put uh, blue bases on four of them like shown here put the blue base on the bottom Again, these don't come painted. Uh, they would be like a dark gray if you haven't painted them. But uh, then we just put them uh, as they're shown in the uh, image in the scenario. So three uh, picked hunters go in, in this area this, uh, of this hut. And one goes in this hut uh, here. So next we have Zogar Sag, and looking at the image for our scenario, we'll see he goes in this stone hut up here. There's his image. There's his model. He doesn't require a color, a colored base since there's only one of him, and so that just goes up here uh, in the stone hut where he's shown. I'll go ahead and put the rest of the figures on the map um, corresponding to our image um, shown in the scenario in the clutches of the pigs. All right, so I've got the figures placed on the board as shown in the image and according to, you know, what we should have according to the river. So I've got all those figures placed on the board. Now I will mention that uh, the picked warrior models, I think if you just got the base game, um, you know, I don't remember the different pledge levels. I think I got the medium, whatever, pledge level when I got this back in 2016. But I think if you just have the base game, you don't have this model for these uh, picked warriors. So instead, you would just use uh, the models of the picked hunters and put uh, the purple bases on them since it shows purple around the border there. Um, but since I the version I got did come with the models for the picked um, warriors uh, and that's the only only ones that are in this scenario I didn't need to put bases on them because those are the only picked warriors the only matching model type in other words the ones where you have um, different model types but represented by different groups like blue or and green and red they're the same model type um, but represent different groups. That's why you would then need to put a, a base matching the border uh, shown on their tile. Then normally the overlord would put this turn tracker near the Book of Skelos. I don't really have room for it near the Book of Skelos, so I'm going to place it over here. But then you'll put the turn tracker on zero and the life point markers uh, for the... Um, characters in the scenario that show they get them like down here I mentioned so uh, if there's icons down here that means that that's their life point markers and what their life point values are so you'll have a life point marker for Zogar Sag and a life point marker for the snake and you'll put them on that turn track uh, on five and eight res respectively so Zogar Seg has five life points, and the giant snake has eight life points. So this turn track, uh, besides um, counting turns in the game, also tracks the life value 
of these particular characters. So whenever Zogar Sag takes damage and the giant snake take damage, they'll move down um, and they're dead when they reach zero life points. Whereas all these other figures on the map, they only have one life point, so as soon as they take one damage, they'll be dead. Now, that's not the same for the heroes. The heroes' life points are represented by these gems. Every time they take a wound, they'll move one of these gems into their wound zone here. If ever all their gems are in their wound zone, then they are dead. Then you read the special rules for the scenario. So, for instance, in this scenario, um, if you read the uh, introduction up here, the Picts have captured the Princess Iselda, or Is Iselda, however you pronounce that, and they've captured her and got her in the uh, in the village. And so, the heroes to win the game, you'll see the heroes. If one or more heroes has fled the village with Iselda and Zogar Zag's head, then Yeselda is returned safely to her father and the heroes win the game. Or if at the end of round eight, the picks, uh, the, at the end of round eight, the picks arrive in massive numbers to witness the sacrifice and the heroes no longer escape, the overlord wins the game. So the overlord just has to hold out till the end of round eight without you escaping with Zogar Zag's head and the princess. But if, if, the, if you manage, if the heroes manage to do that first, then they win the game. If the heroes don't do that by round eight, then the overlord player wins the game. Then you read these special rules. So for this one, about Iselda the princess, um, it says, uh, you'll notice that each of these huts has a number, one, two, three, uh, five, six, seven, eight, there's four up there. So the uh, Overlord player will take these number tokens that match those numbers on the hut and he'll mix them up and then randomly draw one and then that's the one that the princess will be in and so only the Overlord will know that. Oops, <laughs> if I quit flipping it over. Over the over, only the overlord will know that he'll keep that secret. So he'll know. Okay, the princess is going to be in hut seven, which is this one here, as seen here in the scenario. That's number seven. And so what that paragraph is then saying: if uh, the heroes enter that hut, the first time the heroes enter that hut then the overlord would flip this over showing that that's where the princess is then they'll take the princess model and place it uh, in that uh, hut and then the uh, heroes can pick her up she's unconscious the heroes can pick her up and carry her off and if they escape out one of the uh, exits off the board um, with her um, then they then they've escaped with her. If they've also killed Zogar Zag and have his head, then they can take out one of the leave out of one of the exits. And if they do both of those things, they'll win. But anyway, so that's what that paragraph right here is saying in the special rules. The next it says Zogar Zag cannot flee to leave the village. When he dies, place the life point marker in his area to represent his head, and the hero may pick it up. We'll talk more about what a simple manipulation is. A hero can flee the village from an area of the board. Once a hero has fled, they can't return. Uh, then it gives some special rules for the hut flaps. A character must spend one extra movement point to move across a border into or out of a, out of a hut or moving across an opening. So you'll notice these uh, huts have flaps on them. Those are like the doors, I guess, kind of like leather flaps. So normally, and we'll get more into this uh, when we're playing, it costs one movement point just to move a space. But what that rule is saying that is if you move into one of these huts, it costs an extra movement point to move through the door or the hut flap, basically. So from moving from here to here would cost two movement points or from here to here or when you're moving out instead of just costing one it costs two so that's what that rule is saying is when you move through one of the huts moving through the hut flap cost an extra movement point point. and there's just some other rules and then finally it tells you where to place some chests uh, uh, during setup the overlord place one chest in each hut 
so that's a total of eight. Now the chests are represented by these tokens or the version I got also came with five of these chests which I painted. I'm not sure <laughs> why it didn't come with at least eight if scenario, some scenarios like this one will require that many but it only came with five of these so I'll have to use uh, these tokens for the other. So anyway we're going to place one in each hut like so. So I've got a chest in each hut and the heroes can try to open those during the game to find different uh, weapons and armor and that kind of thing in them and we'll talk more about that as we get into gameplay. So the last thing we just have to do is create our asset deck which is uh, what is found the, the items you can find when you open these chests so we need to get two explosive ores, two life potions one chainmail, one crossbow, one buckler, one uh, Bessonian bow. So we'll get all those, shuffle that up, and make our asset deck. Alright, so I went through this deck to find all the items that the scenario said. The two explosive orbs, a Bessonian bow, a chainmail, a crossbow, two life potions, and a buckler. Gather those up, shuffle that deck. And just place that somewhere nearby and again that's what the heroes will draw from if they open the chest um, they'll draw the top card from that deck and that'll be the item they found in that chest but, but before we move on with how to play I forgot to place the reinforcement point markers as shown on the map that's where the overlord can if he uses his event where he can spend reinforcement points to bring back uh, dead units so we need to place those markers on the board. So I've got those here. So that scenario shows one here, one here, and one here basically in the same location that our heroes are starting at. Also, I forgot to put a boulder token here. Um, it says, you know, heroes with climbing ability. A character with climb can move across boulders as they were as though they were a border by spending two extra movement points. I forgot to put that token, which should go right here where this image of boulders are. So they can use that ability to move over those boulders there. And now I think I finally have everything set up. Now I will mention uh, there are uh, lots of other tokens and uh, figures and such that are in that come with the game that are not used in every scenario. So we are not. Uh, seeing every possible token and figure available in the game there's there's a ton more uh, but this is just what's going to be used for this scenario and this will be good to um, show us basically how the game plays it won't cover every possibility because there are some things that uh, are on other maps that may not uh, happen on this map but it should give you a good idea all right so let's move on to how to play all right, so how do we play? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, one versus many. The hero players, or the players on the hero's side, will each control a hero. The overlord will control all these minions that are in his river. The heroes will take their turns first, um, and they will go in no particular order. One hero can do some of their possible actions, and then another one of the heroes can decide to do some of their actions and then maybe the hero that had already done something can go again and then another hero who hadn't done anything so the heroes can continue taking their actions amongst each other in any order they want you know back and forth uh, there's no player order for the heroes and they continue to do that until all of the heroes decide that they can't or don't want to do any further actions after that it is the overlord's turn. So let's start with the hero's uh, turn and how that works. So the first thing on the hero's turn is the start phase. If the heroes had used any gems on the overlord's turn, um, which we haven't talked about how that might work, but maybe on the overlord's turn they were being attacked and they had use some gems here to do the guard action and again we'll talk more about that in a little bit but 
if they had used any gems to do guard or maybe a reroll action at the beginning of the start phase, any gems that they had used up here, they would move down into their fatigue zone. All right, so after all heroes have done that, then we go to the hero's stance phase. And that's where they'll, they will choose their stance. So you have either aggressive or cautious stance. If you choose the aggressive stance, then you'll see you get to move two gems from your fatigue zone over into your ready zone. And that's the same for all of these heroes here. If they take the aggressive stance, they can move two gems from their fatigue zone to their ready zone. And the same here you can see for Shabbatas. Now you'll see there's some skulls here. If one of the heroes has de is dead, then instead of moving two, you can move three gems from your fatigue zone to your uh, to your reserve zone. And if two other heroes are dead um, in the stance phase, and you choose aggressive stance, then you'll get to move four gems from your uh, fatigue zone to your um, reserve. If you choose the aggressive stance, then on your turn you can do any of your possible actions, which we'll be going over what those actions are here in a little bit. But just know if you choose the aggressive stance, then when your hero acts, he can do any of his possible actions. Now if you choose in the stance phase of the cautious stance, you'll see you get to move more gems from your fatigue zone to your reserve zone. You'll normally get to move five. Or if one hero is dead, you can move six. And if two heroes are dead, you can move seven. However, then you cannot do most of your actions uh, during the hero's turn. Uh, the only things you'll be able to do is guard and reroll dice um, during the overlord's turn if he attacks you. Or you can cast reaction spells which are spells with this lightning bolt on them. So the cautious stance, although it lets you uh, recover more of your energy, basically, um, you won't really be able to do much on your turn other than defend yourself until your next turn, then you can choose uh, the aggressive stance. So anyway, in the stance phase, each player will choose whether they want to be aggressive or cautious and recover that amount of gems uh, from their fatigue zone to their reserve. All right, then we go to the actions phase, and in the actions phase, every player that chose the uh, aggressive stance can then take actions, and as I said, there's no uh, turn order. They can, the players, the heroes just coordinate amongst themselves, um, taking turns doing actions you know back and forth until they all decide that they are done or can't do anything else so let's talk about the possible actions so one possible action you have is the melee action as you can see this um, sword icon all the heroes have that or it's an axe icon not a sword but that's the melee action so we'll give an example of how that works a melee action is used to attack a figure in your area so we'll say Conan and this uh, picked um, hunter were in this area and Conan wanted to attack him so to do that you place one or more gems in the melee attack area now the more gems you place the more dice you're going to be able to roll for this attack so if you place one gem here you'll see Conan's going to be able to roll one red dice. Now if you also have a weapon that is a melee attack weapon like Conan has this battle axe, you'll see it has a melee attack. He will get to one roll one additional red dice. So if he just put one gem here he would get to roll one red dice for the melee attack that he chose plus one red dice because he has a weapon. You'll notice the red dice on this weapon has an arrow on it, which allows you to 
re-roll one dice from this attack. So if Conan put one one energy gem here, he would roll one red dice here, one red dice here, and then he would be able to re-roll one of those dice, um, and then that's all he could he could do. Now, if Conan instead assigned two gems here for this attack, then he would get to roll two red dice plus the one red dice. And then he would still get to re-roll one of those dice um, before determining his attack total. So we'll just say for our example here that that's what Conan's going to do. He's in here with this picked hunter. We'll say he's going to put two gems in there. So he'll get two red dice plus he has his weapon that has a melee attack. So three red dice. So he would roll those. And then he does get you know one re-roll of one of those dice so this one's blank so obviously he'd probably want to re-roll that all right so you can see you got three each axe that you get on on your rolls is a success or a hit so you got three four five six now he's attacking a picked hunter so if you look at the picked hunter they have an armor, this here is their armor value, they have an armor, armor value of one, so that blocks one of the hits, so he still gets five hits. Um, they only have a life point of one, so he easily would kill that, and so then you would just remove that picked warrior. If, for example, there were two picked warriors and he had done that one attack and he had killed this one, but there was still another one in there, he could take another attack action. He could spend some more gems and maybe put another one or two gems in there and then roll those dice again. But as you can see, then he's starting to eat up his uh, energy and his reserve, so he has less that he can use for other actions. But you can never put more gems in one of these boxes than the number shown here. So he can ever only on a, on a turn put up to five gems in this attack, melee attack. In this ranged attack, he can only put four. Uh, we'll talk more about those when we get to them, but that's what that number is. That's the maximum number of gems you could move in there. So that's how the melee attack action works. And you'll see they're not the same for each um, player. For instance, here, Hadrathus, he rolls a yellow die on his melee attack instead of a red die, and uh, he has this dagger which allows him to roll one yellow die, but it doesn't have the re-roll arrow on it like you can see like uh, Conan's does. And the dice, you've got uh, yellow, yellow, uh, orange, and red. And so you, you're going to get less powerful hits, less likely to hit on the yellow than you are on the orange. And it's less powerful and less likely to hit than the red. So the red is, is the best one to roll for melee attack or for any attacks. Orange is middle of the road and yellow is the worst. So Hadrathus here, he doesn't have a very powerful melee attack. And Shavata, as you can see, he can roll an orange uh, die for each gem he puts in there. Plus, if he uses this Chris, it has the melee icon, so he'll also get to roll a yellow, which can be re-rolled. You can see it has that arrow on there. Now, I'll mention if you do make a melee attack um, and you do not have a weapon, if you're one of the heroes and you make a melee attack and you do not have a weapon, then you it's considered an unarmed attack and you actually have to subtract two um, from your successes, two from your hits after you make the roll. So that's not uh, advisable really. So you probably usually want to have a weapon if possible to make a melee attack because again if you don't have a weapon it's an unarmed attack and you have to subtract two from your attack total. Alright, next we have the ranged attack, which works similar to the melee attack, but you must have a weapon that has a ranged attack capability, so it has to have this icon on it. So you can see um, Shabatas here has 
the throwing knives it shows it has the ranged attack capabilities so again you can assign one or more gems uh, and for each gem you assign you'll get to roll for this guy he'll get to roll one orange dice and if he's using the throwing knives he would get to roll one yellow die but it does not have the reroll icon and then you know the successes are the same the number of axes you roll uh, are the same now you have to have line of sight to um, whatever you're attacking at a ranged attack and you determine line of sight by uh, drawing a line between these target symbols in the spaces so if Shavatas was here and he was attacking this picked uh, warrior here he would have line of sight because you could trace a line from here to here. In fact, let me just see if I can show that with this laser without crossing. Uh, so that traces without crossing any um, buildings. Now, in this scenario, that it does cross a bush, but if you look in the Overlord's rule book, there's some game board rules, and it shows for the picked village that bushes do not block line of sight. So he would be able to uh, attack from this area to this area with his ranged attack. And in fact, he could also uh, attack to this area because the, uh, let's see if I can, if you trace a line from there to there, it does not cross anything but the bush. And figures, friendly or enemy figures, do not block line of sight. However, like if you were trying to attack, if he was here, he would not have line of sight because his, when you're tracing from there to there, it goes through that barrel and along that wall that blocks line of sight. And there's actually a uh, good website um, called theoverlord.com. If I remember, I'll put a link to that at the bottom of my uh, in my video, and uh, that has a line of sight tool for all the maps that you can see. It. If you're not certain, you can check that and see if one area has line of sight to another area. But like here's an example of it. So you can see from this area, these two areas have line of sight. From this area, all of these green areas have line of sight. And so distance doesn't matter as long as you have line of sight. So if you have line of sight, then, and you always have line of sight in your own, uh, if you're attacking, doing a ranged attack in your area. So if Shavatas was in here, he would definitely have line of sight to this guy. So you always have line of sight in your area, and then you just check if you have line of sight from another area. But again, there's the range doesn't matter as long as you have line of sight. And if you do, then you roll the dice, you know, depending on the number of gems you put there, um, and then roll for your ranged weapon, and then that's your total. And again, you can compare that against the armor value of what you're attacking, and uh, and most of them have one life point, other than except for in this mission or this scenario, uh, Zogar Sag and the giant snake have more than one life point. So if you do damage to them, you just drop them down on their uh, their life points down on this track here. And just like the melee attack, you can attack more than once. Uh, you can attack the same target more than once or different targets. But uh, for this guy, you can never put more than four gems on a turn uh, in the melee attack box. All right, next let's talk about moving. So this is the move action. Each uh, character has a base move action they get for free. So Conan can move two has a base move of two, whereas Hadrathus here also has a base move of two, but Shavatas has a base move of three. So when moving like Conan, Conan has a base move of two, it normally just costs one move, movement point 
to move to an adjacent area, so that would be one, two. That would be his base movement. But you can then add gems into that move action space for Conan up to four to give you additional movement points. So he could um, spend you know, another one and he could move then another additional space. And he could decide to spend another one and move another additional space. Now if you start moving with your base move and then stop to do some other action you lose your remaining base movement points. So for instance Shavatos here has a base move of three if he moved one two into here and then stopped and did a ranged or a melee attack against this picked warrior, he would lose his remaining base movement point from the three he started with. But he could then, uh, after doing that attack, he could then spend a gem to gain an additional movement point uh, to move, you know, there. if he killed this guy and then he, you know, he could move back and then he could spend another gem and so forth. So, um, I just wanted to mention if you stopped, if you're using your base move and you stop to do another action, um, then you lose your remaining base movement points, but you can put gems in there up to the maximum shown in your box here. Four for Shavatas, only two for Hadrathus to move additional spaces. Now, there is something called hindrance that enemy figures in your area can give you when you're trying to move and uh, do uh, some other things like ranged attack which we'll talk about here in a second but say for instance uh, Shavatas is in here with this guy and he wants to move out here well because there's one additional figure in there he has a hindrance so he has to spend an additional movement point to move out of there so normally it would cost one movement point to be here but because he's hindered by one figure, it's going to cost him two movement points to move here. If there were two figures in this area and he wanted to move here, then he's hindered by two points. So it's going to cost him two additional points. So um, it would normally cost one to move here, but because he's hindered by these two figures, it's going to cost him two additional points. So that would cost him three points to move there. Now, if you have a friend, another friendly figure in there, for example, like if Conan was in here, well, he would occupy one of those enemy figures, so you would not get a hindrance from that figure. So there is still one, one figure that's not occupied by another friendly figure, so it would still that one would still hinder Shavatas one point, so it would still cost him two to move to this adjacent space instead of just one. But it won't, it doesn't cost him two additional points because one is blocked by, or, uh, you know, Conan is keeping this one busy, so only one is hindering him. If Hadrathus was in there as well, and so then he was keeping this figure busy, so then neither one of these would hinder Shavatas and he could move to this space for just one point. And that works as the same for the enemy figures. They're, they're hindered by the hero figures uh, on their turn when they're moving, just like the heroes are hindered by en enemy figures on their turn. So we'll talk about how hindrance works for ranged attacks. If um, Shavatas was here and he was going to make a ranged attack against this picked warrior here, because there's one enemy figure in there, He's hindered by one, so he would roll his for his ranged attack, but for every enemy figure that's in there that's not occupied by a friendly figure, then uh, he has to subtract one from his successes. So, for example, if Shavatas attacked this guy and got three successes, he would have to subtract one because there's enemy figure in there hindering him. If there were two enemy figures in here and he rolled and got three successes he would have to subtract two and only then get one success 
But just like movement, if Conan was also in here, he would be occupying one of these figures. So if Shavatos made a ranged attack and got three successes, he would only have to subtract one because there's only one enemy figure in there that's not occupied by a friendly figure. So I hope that makes sense. All right, so that's movement. And uh, along with talking about movement, I talked about hindrance and has, how that works. Another type of action you can take is uh, manipulation. So you have simple manipulation or you have a complex manipulation. So let me give you some examples of what those are. If, for instance, Conan was in this area and this item had been dropped here and he wants to pick up this item, this leather armor, you can do a simple manipulation to pick something up. So you just have to assign a gem there. You don't have to roll anything. A simple manipulation, you're just, you assign a gem and you're automatically successful. And you can pick this item up and then put it in your area. If Conan and Hadrathus were in the same area and Conan wanted to give his leather armor to Hadrathus, he could perform a simple, simple manipulation, assign a gem there. He doesn't have to roll a dice, and he can just give that to Hadrathus, and then Hadrathus can put that in his area. You can just drop an object um, for free. You don't even have to assign a gem. So if Conan just wanted to drop this leather, leather armor in his uh in his area he can do that for free he doesn't even have to assign a gem to the manipulation spot now complex manipulations require you to actually not just assign a gem but roll a dice so for example if Shavatas was in here with this chest and he wants to open it that is a complex uh, manipulation so he would assign one or more gems uh, to this manipulation box and the number of gems he assigns there allows him to roll that many of red dice. Now to open a chest it requires two successes so you know if he assigned uh, two gems there he would get to roll two red dice and he got two successes he would get to open that chest. So then you would remove the chest and then just draw the top card from your asset deck and then he would get whatever that was. Now I, now I will mention that enemy figures provide a hindrance when you're trying to do a complex manipulation. So in this case, if he was trying to open that chest, uh, whatever he rolled, he would have to subtract one for his number of successes because there's one enemy figure in there. So the hindrance works uh, in this case just like if you were doing a ranged attack for every uh, enemy figure in there that's not occupied by a friendly figure you have to subtract one from your successes so um, so opening a chest is one form of complex manipulation so again the number of dice you put in there or the number of gems in there is the number of dice you roll now you may have an item with the manipulation icon on it that allows you to roll an additional die I don't have one out right now another form of complex manipulation is to throw an item so maybe you have an explosive orb item and you want to throw it uh, into an adjacent or a further area so, for example, if Shavatas was here and he wanted to, if he had an explosive orb, um, I don't have one right here, but that is a type of item that's an area effect attack. If he wanted to throw it over here into this, um, this area with these two picked warriors, again, you have to have line of sight to the area. And the item you're throwing has to have an encumbrance value of three or less. We haven't talked about encumbrance yet, so let's do that real quick. You'll see each item here has a value. That's an encumbrance or how heavy it is, how much it adds to what you can carry. So this item has an encumbrance of one. This item has an encumbrance of zero. So if you're going to throw something, it has to have an encumbrance of three or less. So if you're going to throw... If he, if he did have 
like an orb, explosive orb, and he wanted to throw it in here, it, it, um, you would do a complex manipulation. Again, assign gems, rolling that number of dice and the color shown. Um, and you, you have to get a number of successes equal to the distance you're trying to throw it. So he would have to get at least two successes to throw that uh, explosive orb in here. If you only got one success, it would land here instead and affect whatever was in there. You know, friendly, maybe a friendly figure's in there and you accidentally at, attack them. Or if you got zero successes, it would just land in the area you're in and damage you. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're throwing a uh, oh, uh, like an explosive orb. You could be trying to throw a weapon into an area where one of your allies is. Like maybe Conan wanted to throw this battle axe to Shavatas. It has an encumbrance of three or less, so he could throw it. So he may want to do a complex manipulation to try to throw it uh, from, you know, if Conan was here and he wanted to try to throw that axe over to Shavatas to catch... Um, he would have to have at least two successes, but actually he would be hindered by these two guys, so he would need at least four successes. If those guys weren't there, then it's two spaces away, so he would need two successes to get it into Shavata's area. Um, if he only got one success, it would land here. If he got zero successes, it would just drop right here. Now, Shavata's, if Conan threw it over here, he could just let it land and just land on the spot in the area and then Shavatos could later pick it up. But Shavatos can also do a catch, which is a simple manipulation where he would just have to spend one gem and not roll anything and he would just automatically catch it. All right, so those are manipulations. All right, the other two boxes um, on here that we haven't talked about are guard and reroll. So if an enemy is attacking you, you can assign a gem, one or more gems, to the guard action, and that allows you to uh, roll for this guy. It allows him to roll an orange die, or if you place two in there, he could roll two orange die. And then for each success you get, that will subtract one from the attack total of the enemy. Um, you may have, um, if you assign, you don't have to assign a gem to guard and guard. You can just take the total attack if you want. Uh, but if you do guard um, and you have a, some equipment that also has the guard icon, for instance, Conan here, he has this shield. So if he, de if he was being attacked and he decided he was going to guard and spend two gems there. He would get to roll two orange dice, plus he has a shield um, that would allow him to roll an additional orange dice. So his the number of successes he got from that would uh, subtract from the attack total of his attacker. Also, if you have armor, like Conan has this one armor where he'll roll one yellow die, um, even if you don't do the defense, if you don't spend gems on the defense, um, you can always use your armor. So he would get to roll one yellow die and any success he got would subtract from uh, the attack total of the attacker. So that's, that's guard. And finally, the last action space is re-roll. Um, whenever you roll a die, you can, uh, if you don't like the result, you can always spend a gem uh, to re-roll that die, or if you re-rolled two die and didn't like the results, you can spend two gems, two energy, and re-roll two dice. And you can do that as many times as you like, but of course you're limited by the num number of energy that you have. So you can use those re-rolls for any of your, whether you're doing an attack, ranged attack, melee attack, manipulation, a guard, you can always use the re-roll by spending uh, energy to re-roll dice. All right, I did want to go back and mention, you'll notice that some of these weapons, like this Chris, it has the melee attack, but it also has a ranged attack. And then this hand with an arrow, and uh, Conan's battle axe has that as well. So you can use this weapon as a, 
for a melee attack or you can use it for a range attack but if it has this hand with an arrow that means you're throwing it so after you do the ranged attack with it you then have to place it in the space of your target so you know if, Con if Conan uh, did a ranged attack against this picked warrior and threw his axe at it you know doing a ranged attack it would then end up in this space and he would have to move in there and pick it up or another player would have to move in there and pick it up to be able to use it again so you're throwing it away if you use it for a ranged attack you know this kind of weapon now some like the uh, throwing knives they don't have that hand so you you know so it's just assumed like he has multiple of these so he doesn't actually th throw the card and put it in the space where he's attacking whereas if he used the chris for a ranged attack then he would be like he was throwing it so it would land in the area where he was attacking all right let's talk a little bit about spells um hadrathus is a spell caster so he's got he starts with three spells this number up here, then the white number, is the number of energy he must spend to cast that. So if he wanted to cast this lightning storm, he would have to spend three gems. He would put three gems on the lightning storm. You'll see if it's got this icon, it's an area attack. So we'll just look at that one. Attack an area in your line of sight and roll two red dice. If the attack power is greater than the defense power, you know, of the enemies he's attacking, then the, de the defender sandwich, the suffers damage equal to the difference. Now this red number is the same as like these numbers where that's the maximum number of dice that you can put in there. So he could only, it costs three to cast that and the maximum you can put in there is three so he could only cast that once per turn and that number is called your exertion limit so that's the <laughs> the most you can exert to cast that you'll see that works for the same with Mitra's halo which that uh, increases his armor by two but he loses that if he ever goes from a cautious to an aggressive stance so if he he starts with it cast in this scenario, but if he went to cautious um, and then went back to aggressive, he would lose it and then he would have to cast it again. And teleportation just costs one to cast, but then you got to assign a number of gems um, to this card. And for each gem assigned, move your model to an adjacent space. So if he just wanted to move one space, he would have to spend one to cast it and then put one extra gem to teleport one space the good thing about teleport you know he can teleport through walls so he could teleport into um thing but if he assigned you know two gems to it you know he could teleport uh, one to cast it and then one two to teleport right into that hut um, so those are the those are the spells that he starts with there's lots of other spells in the game but uh, that's just the ones that are in this scenario so we're almost done. We talked a little bit about items having an encumbrance value. This number here is the maximum encumbrance that that, that character can have. So Hadrathus can um, only carry items up to a total encumbrance of eight. If he exceeded that, he would have to drop something, whereas Conan can carry items to a total encumbrance of 12. You know, right now, He's got seven, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, Shavatas can carry items with a total encumbrance of 10. He's only got one right now. Now there's some other things we haven't talked about here, which are the skill icons. So each hero has certain skills which are depicted by these icons on their card. And this is one thing I don't really care for about this. You have to go look at these sheets um, or some of the rule book and overlord book at the back also have some of these icons. But they tell you exactly what each of those are. So, for example, Shavatas has this skill, which is evasive. So if you look at it, you find that evasive. This character can move as if there were no enemy characters um, 
in the character's area. So he, when he's moving, he isn't hindered by enemy uh, figures, um, kind of how I was explaining how hindrance doesn't work for movement because he has the evasive skill and none of the other uh, characters that we're using in this scenario have that, but that allows him to not be hindered by enemy figures. However, you'll see this number here, five, that's an encumbrous value. If he is ever encumbered by carrying items uh, that total five or more, he loses that skill. He no longer has that skill. Uh, just like this one, which is untouchable. What if you look here? That's a defensive skill. Untouchable. When this character defends against a ranged attack, their armor value is increased by one for that defense. But if he was ever carrying six encumbrance or more of items, he loses that, uh, that ability as well. So that's how these skills work. You have to look up what each of them are. You know, you'll get to know what they are if you play enough, which I haven't, so I usually have to look them up. But it kind of, that game comes with these cards that tell you what all these abilities are. And like I said, some of them are better defined on the back of the rule books. And one last thing about encumbrance. You'll notice here there's a movement icon. If uh, Shavatas ever is encumbered with a total of six or more, he loses one from his movement. So his base movement is two, and then when he... Um, if he wanted to use gems to spend and to go an extra movement, he would have to, because he loses one, he would have to spend two gems to move one extra space. And if he has an encumbrance total of nine, he loses two from his movement. And that's different from for each figure, so a uh, little less um, for Hadrathus and a little more for Conan. I think that pretty much covers... The hero's side and how they work so after they've done their actions then um, they go to the end phase so then they move all gems that they spent so if Conan say spent these two to attack and this one to move you move all those to their fatigue zone and uh, Hadrathus cast these three for a spell those would go to his fatigue zone um, Savatas use these two for manipulation. Those would go to a fatigue zone. All right, and then that ends their turn. So then they only have this number of gems available during the Overlord's turn that they could maybe use for defense or rerolls for defense. And then at the beginning of their next turn, depending on their stance, they're only if they choose aggressive, they're only going to move two back over there. So you can see you start can start running low on gems so eventually you're probably going to have to take a cautious stance to move more gems into your reserve so you can take more actions on your turn. Alright so now we'll talk about the overlord's turn so after, again after the heroes have completed doing any actions they want to do or can do with their available energy we then move to the overlord's turn. Alright so on the overlord's turn first thing they would do is move any gems they'd spent on guard action or re-rolls or if they had any reaction spells that they'd spent uh, energy on which in this scenario the overlord doesn't have any spells but uh, anyway at the beginning of their turn in the recovery phase if they had spent any gems on the hero's turn for guarding or re-rolls or spells they would move those to their fatigue zone they then move a number of gems from their fatigue zone to their uh, reserve according to the number shown on this tile here. So in this scenario, they would always move five energy gems over to their reserve from the fatigue zone. And that phase is the recovery phase. Next, you go to the advanced time marker phase where you advance the time marker one space. And then you go to the activation phase. And in the activation phase, the overlord can activate uh, zero, one, or two tiles from the river and activate the corresponding uh, miniatures 
um, that go with that tile. So, for example, to activate the picked hunters, the overlord could spend one gem because the cost to activate the picked hunters is one energy gem. So they would move that to their fatigue zone. They then pick up that picked hunters tile, shift all the other tiles down, and move the picked hunter tile to the far right of the river. Then they can activate all the blue picked hunters. So that includes these three and this one as we started with four picked hunters on the board. So you'll see that the picked hunters have a base movement of two. So um, the overlord could move each of the picked hunters two movement, uh, two spaces. Now as we saw in the rules for this scenario, moving through a flap on a hut, either in or out, cost uh, an extra movement so it would cost two to move two movement to move out of this hut for this blue picked warrior so that would be all that he could move however the overlord could spend gems to place in this movement box to give the that picked uh, uh, hunter another movement point and then he would be able to move another space just like that works for the heroes um, where they can put uh, energy gems into that movement box um, then that gives them extra movement points so again he would get to activate all the picked hunters so he could move each of these other ones two spaces as well so because they're in a hut and it costs two to move through this flap that would be two 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 so that's all the movement they could do unless the uh, Overlord move, puts a gem in the movement, and then he would have that. That would allow him to move one one of those picked hunters an additional movement point. So, uh, if he wanted to move all of them one additional movement point, he would have to put four gems in there. Now you'll notice there's no uh, exertion limit um, for the uh, here. For the overlord but they can never each one can never move uh, more than its base movement so or you know get gems added to have it move additional spaces more than its base movement so uh, you know each picked warrior can move two base movement and then they could each uh, have at least at max two more to move them i hope i'm saying that so that makes sense and then you see they can do a melee attack. So if they are in an area with uh, an opponent, for instance, if Conan was in this space and they all moved out into that space, then each one of those picked hunters would be able to do a melee attack against Conan, rolling two yellow dice, and both of those dice could be re-rolled as they have the arrows on them. Now the Overlord needs to do all their movement with their uh, figures or models um, for that group before they attack because as soon as one of them attacks then all movement for all of them is over so if this if he activated these picked hunters and this guy moved out here and then this guy moved out here and then attacked Conan, then none of the other blue picked hunters could move because as soon as one of them attacks, then that ends the movement for all of them. So it's better to move all of them first and then do your attack. And attacking works just like how I explained for the heroes, only this is the dice they roll and the total of successes they get is their attack power. And then whoever they're attacking could spend gems uh, on the guard action and, and get to roll for defense and then whatever the defensive total uh, is subtracted from the attack total and then it, what if there's a positive value then they do that much damage to the hero and as I mentioned earlier if a hero takes damage they have to move gems from their fatigue zone to their wound zone if they don't have any in their uh, wound zone then they take them from spots they may have placed them on action spots if they don't have any there then they have to take them from their reserve and if they don't have any 
uh, anywhere except for in the wound area, then they're dead and their model is removed from the board. Now you'll see these picked hunters do have an, a leap ability. However, for this scenario, uh, leap doesn't matter. So that special ability doesn't really come into play in this scenario. But you'll just notice that some of these um, units do have special abilities. And again, you can reference those cards to see what they, what they are. So as I was saying, the Overlord can activate zero, one, or two tiles on their turn. So if he activated these picked hunters, he moves them over here, you know, moves them all, does whatever attacking or whatever he's going to do with those. Then he can pick another tile. Now he could pick the picked hunters again, but now you could see it costs eight energy. He would have to move eight of his energy over to the fatigue zone to um to activate that tile again so the further are further the tiles are down the river they're cheaper to activate so he could then you know if he wanted to maybe spend two to activate the picked warriors so then he would shift this down and then he would be able to move all the picked warriors uh, again that's these there's only three in this scenario but he would be able to move each of them up to two and then again he could spend gems to move them additional spaces and as i talked about during the uh, heroes overview these these guys also have an armor value it's a you know so when they're attacked they get a base armor value that subtracts from the attack value two for these uh, picked warriors just one for these uh, picked hunters and of course their life points are just one uh, the picked warriors have the you know have this leap ability which i said doesn't matter in this scenario but they also have this ability which is blocking so enemy characters without evasive cannot move out of this character's area so if Conan moved in to an area with a picked uh, warrior then he can't move out of that area because he doesn't have that evasive skill remember Shabatas did but Conan does not so he would have to fight and kill those uh, a picked warrior if he was in a space with them um, before he could move out because they have that blocking skill now in this scenario there's two uh, two of these tile that, tiles that just represent one figure. So if he were to activate uh, Sogar Sag, Z Zogar Sag, and move it over there, then he would just act, activate the one figure of, of Zogar Sag, who has three movement. Uh, he has a melee attack of two orange dice that he can re-roll. Uh, if he's in the same area of who he's attacking. He is a spell caster, but in this scenario he doesn't have any spells, so in other scenarios he may. Uh, and that's similar uh, with the giant snake. That's a single figure, so when he activates that giant snake, he just uh, activates moves and attacks with that snake figure. So as I mentioned, as the... Uh, as you activate these further on the left, they're cheaper to activate. You can activate this stuff further on the right, but again, it's more expensive to do that. The event tile for the Overlord, you look at the scenario um, to tell you what to do when you activate that. So, you know, if this was down here, you may want to activate that event tile. It would cost you four to activate it. And as we saw earlier, in this scenario, activating that tile gives you four reinforcement points. And reinforcement points are for bringing back uh, dead uh, figures. So let's talk about more about that. Because um, at the beginning of the scenario, nobody's dead. There wouldn't really be any reason for that. Uh, let's say at some point during the gameplay all the hyena figures were eliminated so they're all they're all killed all off the board so when all the corresponding figures for a tile are eliminated you 
flip that tile over and shift it to the back of the river. It stays in the river. It's got that like blood mark on it to show that all those figures are eliminated. And so as, as other tiles are activated, it will move down the river, but it kind of clogs it up because you have, there's nothing you can do with it because there's no units to activate with it. Um, but if you use this in this scenario that gives you four reinforcement points, you can look at the cost down here. So for these picked hunters, they cost one reinforcement point. The uh, hyenas also cost one reinforcement point, and the warriors cost two. So if you do that scenario or that event that gives you four reinforcement points, you can spend those to bring figures back um, to life. So if you these guys are all dead, you could spend four reinforcement points and you can see they cost one each. So you could bring four hyenas back and you can just place them in any of the areas that have the reinforcement token on them. So you could put one there, one there, and maybe two up here where Conan is. And that's how you'd spend those. And once you've done that, then you can flip that tile back over and that's active again where you can activate it to activate those hyenas on they'll start from where they're at instead of where they were at the beginning of the at the scenario as the game goes on the overlord may have you know several tiles that are flipped over to their bloodied side because all those units have been eliminated and they're clogging up his his slots in the river so what the overlord can do is called dredging the river so on his turn for each of those tiles he can permanently remove uh, two gems two energy gems from the game not move them over to his fatigue zone but permanently remove them from the game and then he can remove a, a tile that's you know flipped over to its bloodied side from the river and then it's no longer clogging it up and he could do that for as many as he wants that he has like that but the, again those gems are permanently removed from the game um, not moved to the fatigue zone and uh, when you do that when you dredge the river to remove these tiles you take the gems you're going to permanently remove first from the fatigue area uh, if there's none in there then you can take them from some of these areas if none there then you have to take them from your reserve area to do that but again when you're activating these units it works just like it does does with the heroes um, you know they can have hindrance if if uh, one of them if two heroes are in the same area as a um, one of these as a picked warrior and he wants to move out of course he'll be hindered and have to use extra movement points they use you know some have melee attack now i think all of them in this scenario are melee attack but some could have ranged attack or spells uh, in other scenarios and that works just like i mentioned for the heroes and also as i mentioned uh, if they're being attacked the uh, and they want to use a guard um the the uh, Overlord can spend gems to have one of those units do a, a guard. They always get their base armor that's shown there, but then uh, they can do a guard. And they, whenever the Overlord figures roll for guard, they roll an orange die. And, of course, they have the re-roll as well, where he can re-roll any dice he wants as long as he spends a gem there. So that's, you know, pretty much how the Overlord does his turn. He can activate uh, zero, one, or two tiles on his turn. When he activates it, he moves it to the end of the river, river and then activates all the figures that go along with that tile. Then when the Overlord is done activating, he just moves any gems. You know, if he had put some gems up here, he moves them to his fatigue zone. Um... And then that ends his turn, and then it goes back to the heroes who will start with their the beginning of their turn. So really not much different uh, as far as how the uh, figures actually move and attack. Um, 
from the heroes. The only thing different is how the Overlord determines which ones he's going to activate and spins gems to activate those uh, certain tiles and the figures that are associated with that tile. One thing that's different is, um, you know, I said all of these figures have a melee attack and these are the dice that they roll for their melee attack. The figures in this scenario, anyway, all have melee attack. Now the heroes, I said when they do a melee attack, if they don't have a weapon that they're using, then uh, it's considered an unarmed attack and they subtract two from their attack total. All of the uh, units that the Overlord activates that use a melee attack are considered to be an armed attack. They're considered to have a weapon. So even though they don't have a weapon card like the heroes do, they are considered to have a weapon so they don't subtract anything from their attack total. So the only one that may have, like a spell caster may have spells in other scenarios, but uh, not in this one. So that pretty much covers the Overlord. We'll talk about a few other things. Conan has an ability that can be used in this scenario called Wall Wrecker. And he can use that to go through the walls of these wooden huts, not through the stone huts. But he can move, he could move from here, uh, break through the wall of one of these uh, wooden huts using his Wall Wrecker ability. Again, you can see uh, it's this one right here. And if you look at what it says, the character can spend two movement points to move across a wall or wooden door from one area to an adjacent area and place an open, opening token on that, app, that obstacle. Treat an opening token as a border that does not block line of sight. So, and on this card it says spend two movement points, but on the back of the manual uh, um, of the one of the rule book, it says spend two additional move points. So if Conan was here um, and he wanted to wall wreck into this hut, it would actually be three movement points because it's the one movement point plus two additional movement points. So he would have to spend three movement points to move in there, break through that wall. And then he places this token there. And then that counts as just an opening. So then to leave there, you know, it would only cost one movement point. Well, other than the hindrance, but if he killed all those guys it would just cost one movement point to move out of there and i believe the giant snake has that ability also the wall wrecker and the blocking there are some other abilities that uh, may come into play in our example turns and if so i'll talk about them then but i think i've pretty much covered uh, how the game works so again the scenario tells you how you win uh, if you remember for this one the heroes have to uh, kill zogar zag and pick up his head um, they also have to find which hut contains the princess which we know is hut seven which is this one but the heroes don't knew that know that till they move in there and then somebody has to pick the princess up and exit the board with her now the one caveat there is she, if you read the special rules, she has an encumbrance of six. So that adds a lot of weight to whoever has to carry her. And that starts negating a lot of their special abilities as well. So I'm going to set everything back up to how it uh, should be right after we did set up. And we'll go through a few example turns and that should really let you uh, see how the game works in action and um, I think you'll have a good understanding of it. So let's uh, move on to sample turns. All right, I think I've got everything set back how it should be right after we did set up. And so now we'll start. Again, the heroes uh, start first and the first thing on the heroes turn is the start phase and they would move any gems uh, energy gems that they had placed on the overlord's turn of course on the first turn of the game there's not going to be any so we just might as well skip that part 
So next we go to the stance phase. So each player will choose their stance. So we'll say Conan's going to be aggressive. So he gets to recover two gems. So they go from his fatigue zone to his um, his reserve. And we'll just hit, all the heroes are going to do the same. They're going to have an aggressive stance. So they'll all recover two energy from their fatigue zone to their reserve zone. All right, so now that's the stance phase. Now we go on to the action phase, and so the players can go in whichever order uh, they want to do. So we'll start with Conan. Um, he's got two basic movements, so we'll just say he's going to go ahead and move one, two to here. And then just to show that the others can go you know that there's no turn order or anything so Shavat does he's got a movement of three we'll say he's going to move uh, one two and we'll have him stop there and he's gonna make a ranged attack against this picked warrior so that's gonna forfeit he had three movement points but because he's stopping and attacking that's gonna forfeit his uh, remaining basic movement point there, base movement point. He does have line of sight. You check from that uh, target to that target. It doesn't cross any buildings or terrain or anything that would block line of sight. So we'll say he's going to put uh, two into his ranged attack. So he'll get to do two orange dice. And then he's using his throwing knives, so he'll get a yellow dice as well. All right, so two orange and a yellow. He got uh, four. Now his from his throwing knives that doesn't have a re-roll, so he doesn't get to re-roll his yellow. So he got four successes or four hits. Now the picked warrior he's attacking has a base armor of two. But that still means two hits are going to get through, which one is enough to kill him because he's only got one life point. So well, the Overlord's going to say he's going to do a guard. He's just going to put one gem there. So he'll get to roll one orange die. So he's going to roll. Now oh, he got a blank. So he can't say, oh, I meant to put two so he can roll two dice. So the guard is done. You know, if he wanted to roll two, he should have done that. Uh, right away now he could spend a gem to do a reroll so let's say he's going to do that just to uh, show how that works and he got two so he's happy with that because now with uh, four attack two of them are blocked by the guard which leaves two to get through and two of those are blocked by his armor so that leaves zero left to do a uh, damage to his one life point. So the picked warrior takes no no hit. Now Shavatas could attack again. He could put another one or up to two more gems there and roll again and do the same attack again. But we'll just say for now he's gonna he's gonna stop. We'll see what the other guys are gonna do. So Hadrathos has two basic movement. So we'll have him move one two into there and then uh, we'll have him do his lightning storm it's kind of a waste just on one guy but I just want to show how it works that is an area effect so if there were mul multiple people in there it would attack each person in there individually but he's going to cast that so that's going to cost him three three uh, points and it and he can only cast it once per turn because it you know, had the red number there is three. So he can't put any more than that on it. But he gets to roll two red die. Ah, that's pitiful. <laughs> so he only got one. Now he could spend one on a re-roll. But I don't think he's going to do that. So one, we know that's not going to uh, do anything because that guy has two armor. So... That was kind of just a terrible waste of that spell. Let's come back to Conan. He's going to spend one uh, energy on movement. So that allows him one movement point 
which he's going to use to move here into this space with this picked uh, warrior. And then he's going to attack that picked warrior. So he's going to spend two on a melee attack. So that lets him roll two red dice. Plus he's using his weapon, so three red dice. And he can re-roll one if he wants. So I think he's going to re-roll this one that just got one. Alright, so good. So he got uh, six successes. So we'll just say the Overlord, he knows two are blocked, so he would need at least four more. So he would have to spend two on guard. And we'll say he's going to do it just to show how it works. So he's going to spend two on guard, so he, he'll get to roll two orange dice to guard. And he only got two successes. Um, he could re-roll, but he's not going to spend more gems to re-roll. So two successes uh, plus the two armor, that's only going to block four out of the six hits. So... Uh, that's going to be enough. That's still two that get through. Only one's necessary. So this guy is killed. So we'll just remove him from the board. And I think for now, you know, the heroes still have gems. They could do more. But for now, uh, they're going to say they're done. They all say they're done. So now we go to the end phase. So they'll move all the gems they used into their fatigue zone. So... I'll take his from his spell, put them in his fatigue zone, and Shavatas just used these, so he'll put those in his fatigue zone. All right, so now their turn is done. So now it's the Overlord's turn. We go to the recovery phase. So first thing he'll do is move all the gems he spent on the hero's turn to his recovery or his fatigue zone, and now he gets to recover a number of gems as seen here. So five. So one, two, three, four, five. And now he goes to his activation phase. So he'll spend one, goes to his fatigue zone to activate the blue picked hunter group. So he slides it down here and then he gets to move them. They all have a movement of two. So it's going to cost them that much to move out of their from the flap so that's one two one two one two so they all move in there where Hadrathus is and this blue one he's going to move out as well um, so he's going to move there that's going to cost two movement because it's one for the movement plus one to move through the flap door all right where well, all these that are in here with Hadrathus uh, can do a melee attack against him so we'll start with this guy doing a melee attack they get two yellow dice, which they can re-roll both of them. So he rolls, and two hits, he'll take that. He's not going to re-roll. Well, no, he'll just take that. He's not going to re-roll. No, he will re-roll because uh, Hadrathus has Mitro's Halo on, which makes his armor value increased by two he hasn't doesn't have any other armor but that's going to make his armor value two so that's going to block both of those so he may as well he may as well re-roll them both so and remember he gets two because they have the arrow so he can re-roll both of them and that's still only two okay so he doesn't do any damage because Hadrathus has Mitra's Mitra's halo on all right so now this other picked warrior is going to attack he gets the same thing. Uh, he only got two. Um, he's not going to re-roll that one. He will re-roll this one. Now, let me... ah, nothing. So again, that's not enough to do any damage because of the Mitra's Halo. So finally the last uh, picked uh, hunter in there is going to attack. And he does three damage. So he'll stick with that. So... Two of them are blocked by Mitro's halo, but one of the damage gets through. So, uh, Hadrathus says he's going he's gonna to do a guard action. So he'll put one gem in there, and he'll get to roll one orange die. He only has to get one success to block, well, which he fails. 
so he could spend one on a re-roll and re-roll it, but he's not. He'll just go ahead and take the one damage. So we slide one um, gem over from the fatigue zone to the wound zone. All right, and now all these picked hunters have done all they can do. Now he could, the, the uh, overlord could spend some gems uh, on movement to have them move again, but they couldn't attack again. And he thinks he'll just leave them there to attack uh, Hadrathus again. So um, he, can, he can activate up to two tiles, so he is going to activate another one. Uh, I think this time he will activate, he'll spend three to activate these hyenas. So he moves three gems over there, moves this to the end of the river. All right, they each have a movement of five. And they have that evasive, so they don't get hindered by enemy uh, figures in their space. All right, they have a movement of five, so it's going to cost them two to come out of this flap. So one, two, and then three to move in here with uh, Shavatas. And this guy will move in there with Shavatas as well. Now, these ones have to come out two flaps because they've got to move through this one and this one. And uh, one rule that I didn't mention in my rules overview is a space can be considered occupied if, if like if this guy moves, so he can move one, two, three, four out here. But now this space is almost occupied. Occupied is when you can't fit the full base of a unit in there. So this guy can move one, two, three, four and then he's in this space. But now no more. This guy couldn't fit in here. His full base could not fit in here anywhere. So this space is considered occupied. So he can't he can't move in there or move through there. But then that becomes considered adjacent to him. So like if he just moves here, one, two, this space is considered to adjacent to him now because this space is occupied and he can attack in there, though the figures in the occupied space cannot attack into the adjacent space. So he can attack in there, but they can't attack to where he is. Or, you know, this guy is the only one that would, but Hadrathus can't attack him. But all right, all the hyenas have moved, so now they're going to attack. So they have a melee attack of one orange dice. So this one will attack Hadrathus with his orange dice. He gets nothing. Um, I'll spend one to re-roll. The Overlord will spend one to re-roll that. Alright, so he gets one hit. Uh, Savatus has no armor or anything so he could do a guard to try to block that hit but uh, he doesn't want to spend a die on a guard I don't think so he'll just go ahead and take the wound All right now the other in there with him is gonna attack so he gets one orange dice and he gets one uh, the overlord he's gonna spend that and re-roll and try to get a two oh he fails, so that was a mistake. Uh, I could spend another one and re-roll again, but uh, Overlord doesn't think he's going to do that, so that attack just misses. But now all three of these hyenas get to attack Hadrathus, so we'll say this one is attacking first. He gets two. That's blocked by Mitra's halo. There's really... No way they can hit him on this dice because there's not a three. So there's really no sense in even rolling for the other two because they can only get at most a two on this orange dice and his halo blocks too. So he's not going to take any damage. So there's really not a point in, in rolling this uh, attack for those other ones. So that's going to end their attack. So now we go to the end phase of the Overlord. He'll move these ones he spent on re-rolls to his fatigue zone. If he had spent any on spells or movement, he would move them to his fatigue zone, and then that's going to end his turn. 
uh, one thing we forgot to do at the start of the uh, Overlord's turn was advance the round track. And remember, the Overlord wins if, if uh, by the end of round eight, uh, the heroes haven't completed their objectives. All right, we'll do one more quick round. So it's the start of the heroes phase. So um, at the start, they'll move any gems they placed on the heroes or on the Overlord's turn to their fatigue zone. I think Hadrathus is the only one that did that. All right, then we go to the stance phase. Conan's going to stay aggressive, so he just recovers two. Hadrathus, he'll stay aggressive, so he'll just recover two. And uh, Savatas, he'll stay aggressive, so he'll just cover, recover two as well. All right, we'll have Conan. He's going to use his two. He's going to use his wall breaker ability, so he's going to spend his two basic movement plus one additional movement point to wall break into this hut. So the door is over here, but he's going to wall break in through this wall right here. So he moves in there. That costs three movement, two, at one, the one regular movement plus the two for the wall break. So we'll put the wall break token there. So now that is uh, an open space. It only costs one to move out. It doesn't block line of sight. But he's in there with these. Uh, picked hunters now Conan has this ability circular strike which when this character kills an enemy character with a two-handed melee attack and any weapon that's uh, three encumbrance or greater is considered considered two-handed so his battle axe is two-handed um, when this character kills an enemy character with a two-handed melee attack Another enemy character in the same area suffers the excess damage from the attack. If that character is killed, just repeat the process. So if he does enough damage to kill the first character he's attacking, then his you know, axe keeps swinging and any leftover damage is applied to the next character and so on. So he's going to use his circular strike and we'll just say he's going to attack this picked hunter. He'll put... Uh, two gems in there so he'll roll two red dice plus the one red die for his weapon so three red dice yeah we'll really go for it he's going to put another one so uh, he's going to roll four red dice and he gets to re-roll one so he'll roll this one that got a blank yeah terrible that's ridiculous all right, so four damage. All right, so those are the red picked hunters. They have an armor of one, so that's three damage. We'll say the overlord is going to go ahead and do a one guard, so he'll have the, that guy roll one orange die. Oops, that rolled out. So blank, so nothing. So he hit him with four. His armor absorbs one. And then it takes one to kill him. So one's dead. There's two damage left over. So he his axe continues to swing to the next guy with two damage. So the overlord says, eh, he's going to guard with that guy. And he blocks them both with that guard. So I'd hoped to kill all three guys with that attack. But unfortunately my attack roll was terrible. So Conan only killed one of those guys. That must not be the real Conan. All right, Hadrathus is in here with all these people. So normally, because of uh, hindrance, there's one, two, three, four, five extra guys. He would have to use five extra movement points to get out of there. But he can use teleport, because tel teleport ignores hindrance. So what he's going to do, he's going to spend one to cast it, and one to move to one adjacent spot. So he teleports here. All right. So now he is going to cast his lightning storm in this space. So he's going to spend his last three uh, energy to do that. It's an area effect, so it's going to affect all of these guys. Now, there's a guy in there, but... Uh, Casting spells is not affected by hindering, so that's not going to matter. 
I guess there's just one, two, three, four, five guys in here. This guy isn't in here. All right, so he's going to roll his two dice to get his attack power. Uh, one just rolled out. Oh, that's terrible. All right, so he's got an attack total of two, so we'll go for the hyena first. I mean, he's going to attack all of them with that same total, but the hyenas have zero armor. So the overlord says, all right, I'm going to spend one to guard that hyena. So he'll roll one orange. He only blocks one. The other one is enough to kill his one life point. So this hyena's dead. All right, now this one gets hit with the total of two. Overlord says forget it. He's not going to guard that hyena. So that hyena's killed as well. All right, now we're going for the picked hunters. Um, they do have one armor, but our attack total is two. That's the blue ones. They're, but they're all the picked hunters are the same. The attack total is two, so... They will be killed. So the overlord says, yeah, I'm going to spend one to guard. We'll say we're going for this one right now. All right, so he blocks both of those so that guy survives. Um, eh, he'll spend his last uh, guard, his last gem to guard that other picked hunter. He blocks it, and the other one doesn't have, there's no gem left to guard. He only blocks one with his armor, so the other one takes his life point, so... He's killed. All right, Shavatos is in here with these hyenas, but he's just going to move out of there. He's got a base movement of three. Because of his evasive, he's not hindered by them. So he's going to move one, two, three into this hut with this chest, and then he's going to try to open that chest. So that's a complex manip manipulation. He's just going to put one die in there to roll one red dice. But he's got the lock picking skill, which this allows the character to roll an extra red dice when picking a lock, which that's what he's doing. So he gets to roll two red dice. Opening a chest, picking the lock just requires two successes, which he got four. So he is successful. So we remove that chest, draw the top card from the asset deck, and he got a life potion. So that allows him to move two, um, he can spend that to move two wounds or uh, gems into his reserve. He can take it from the wounds or uh, anywhere really, but you would really want to take it from your wound. So he's going to save that till he has another wound, I think. It has zero encumbrance, so it's really not weighing him down or anything. All right, and then we'll have him spend one movement for, well, it cost him two movement point to move out, so um, he'll spend two movement points to um, move out of this hut because he's got to spend one plus one for the flap and then he's going to spend two no he's going to spend one on a ranged attack with his throwing knives to attack uh, these hyenas he does have line of sight so uh, he's spending one so that's an orange and one yellow, so he's attacking a hyena. Oh my goodness, I rolled that dice out of there. And he gets one hit. The hyenas have no armor. The overlord has no gems to spend on defense. So the one hit is all that's required to kill him. So this one's eliminated. And I think that's pretty much all Shabbatas is going to do. So all the heroes say they're done at this point. All right, so start the Overlord's turn. He moves all these gems to his fatigue zone. And then he gets his recovery amount, which is five. So one, two, three, four, five. He advances the turn marker. Now he starts his action phase. Uh, we'll say he'll spend... 
two, oops, two to activate these picked warriors. Um, there's two on the board, so he'll move uh, one over here with Shabatas. They have uh, two movement points, so he'll move that one there, and he'll leave this one here. All right, so this one's going to attack Hadrathus. They get one red die. They got two. He can re-roll it because it's got the arrow. Um, Hadrathus still has his Mitra's halo on, so he needs at least three to hit him. Failed. All right, so nothing successful there. All right, this one's going to attack Shavata, so he gets his one red die. Oh, almost a three. All right, well, he got one. He'll re-roll it. Remember, he gets the one re-roll. And if I can get this stuff to stay in there, eh, still just one. So Shavata, he'll try to block that. So he's going to guard, so he's going to roll an orange dice. And he blocks it so he doesn't have to take any damage. All right, so there's only two uh, picked warriors, so that's all that he can do with that move. So, all right, so we'll just have him, he'll activate uh, Zogar Sag. So uh, he's he just costs one gem, so he's going to spin that. Him with Zogar Sag. And he has three movement. And he attacks with, uh, or has three movement, and he attacks with two orange dice. So, of course, it costs two to move out of the flap, and then, uh, so it's two, three, that's all he can move. So, unfortunately, he can't attack. Now, he could spend a gem to move him one more. He'll do that. He's going to spend a, a movement point to move Zogar Sag in there, and then. He'll spend his last, um, or uh, he'll have Zogar Sag attack. He gets two orange dice. So he got two hits. So Shavatas will spend one to guard. He blocks nothing, so he's got to take two damage. So he's got to move two gems over here to his wound. Now, so probably on his next turn, he'll use his life potion. But that's all Zogar Sag can do. So that's two tiles the Overlord activated. So now it's the end phase. So the Overlord will just move this gem to his fatigue zone. And then that's going to end his turn. And then it would be the hero's turn again. But this video is way long. I think you have a good idea now, or you should have a good idea now of how the game plays. I think it's uh, I think it's a fun game. It doesn't really take too long. At least this scenario doesn't. Really, the heroes need to start spending some time getting into these um, huts, looking for the uh, the princess. Now Conan did move into this one, and Shavatas did move into this one, so they know the princess isn't there. If if she was, the overlord would have had to reveal it, but we know the princess is in this hut. So they know that she's not in this hut, but they need to start searching the others, and soon that snake's going to come out and start wreaking havoc too. But anyway, fun game. The rule book is not the greatest, and I, I think, you know, I even have the version 2 of the rule book, but it's still not the greatest. So uh, I, I think the version 1 was probably uh, even worse. But you can, you can figure it out. And if you watch a tutorial like this one, you'll definitely understand how to play. Now, as I said, there's different scenarios and they introduce some different rules like uh, falling and attacking from elevated positions and that kind of thing. But... Uh, if you get this game, you can just read those rules. Uh, pretty much what I've covered is the basics, and then there's some things that are a little different per scenario. But uh, that's it. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.